So good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, Dr. Iman, for this uh, introduction. So I'm really glad to share this tandem talk with uh, Dr. Vito Anisi. So my part, I'll talk about the point of care intestinal ultrasounds in the IBD clinic. Here are my disclosures. So during the upcoming 15 minutes, I'll, t uh, I'll focus on the radiological role imaging, uh, and of images in the management of the IBD, and then we're gonna go through uh, the importance of intestinal ultrasounds in diagnosing and monitoring patients with IBD. And then I can give you some, like the key components of identifying a patient with IBD using the ultrasound machine, and I will wrap up my presentations talking about some suggestive algorithm that we can do it in our clinical practice. So starting with such a case, we have Mr. Fahad, he's 24 years old, diagnosed as a case of terminal iliac Crohn's disease. It was fibrosternotic stricture, and we can see here from the MRI uh, uh, images that even pre or post contrast, we had the long fibrotic structures with the pre stenotic dilatation. He underwent iliocolonic resection, the patient did very well, he was totally asymptomatic, and as usual, typical Arabic patients, he disappeared. After 10 months, he presented to the clinic. Out of the blues, he decided to come and show his face. He told me, well, doctor, I'm still doing well. I have no problem, but I just came to check on myself. I was quite worried, so we proceeded with intestinal ultrasound for this patient. I don't know if you're familiar with such an images, but this is the, uh, where, do I ha where do I keep the arrow? This is the anastomotic site. And we can see that it has like a genuine bowel wall thickening because usually the ideal cutoff measures is three millimeter. And in this patient, it was like 7.7. .7. And that rings the bell that what's going on? Are we dealing with the recurrence of the disease or any sort of inflammation? So I checked the vascularity of this patient because vascularity means inflammation. And the patient was having quite a good inflammations in the bowel wall. So we, have, we use a score for such patients, and usually out of four, this patient was three. So I scoped this patient, and this is the finding. The patient has strictures, he has ulcerations, so he has a disease recurrence. And here it comes that patient, if he's asymptomatic, that doesn't reflect the disease activity, as Dr. Mohammed you have mentioned earlier. So we know as a gastroenterologist or IBD specialist that now the treatment target is being evolved and we are aware about the STRI2 trials that has been published recently. Now we have a target to keep the patient in a short term in a symptomatic remission, the intermediate term in a biochemical remission, and in the long term to give the patient a good quality of life, we need endoscopic remission. In addition to this, we need in a case of Crohn's disease, transmural healing if possible, and histological remission in a case of ulcerative colitis. So in order to reach this target, we need some other tools that we can use, and, most, uh, and for sure we have to go with cross-sectional images. As a doctor who knows how to do bowel ultrasound, I'm very happy that STRI2 trial has included bowel ultrasound as a, as, a, as a part of the imaging modalities that can be used to monitor and diagnose an IBD patient. Also, they stated that a bowel ultrasound has a good ability to assess the degree of the inflammations. Also, it has the advantage of visualizing the whole GI tract and including the transmural healing, which is the uh, targets of most of the IBD specialists. So focusing in the uh, point of care bowel ultrasound, why do we like it? We like it because it's safe, non-invasive, doesn't need any sort of preparations, it can be repeated very frequent, and the patients got engaged and well liked by the patients. Dynamic, if the patient presents to your clinic with any sort of symptoms, you can just scan him within 15 minutes to get the diagnosis if he's having an element of flare or no, and it's easily accessible, so you can just pull the machine from, uh, from clinic to, to other clinic. I, would, I won't say that it's a piece of toys because, or I like to use the bowel ultrasound because most of the uh, uh, doctors who know how to do the bowel ultrasound are very interested to know, is it there in the, gui in the guidelines? And we're really happy to know that the echo Esger guidelines, the mainly the European guidelines and the IFSM guidelines now are including the bowel ultrasound as part of diagnosis and measurement. And even crossing the, age, uh, the oceans all the way to, the, uh, to Australia, also bowel ultrasound is one of the modalities that can be used to monitor and follow the patients. We're waiting for the North American, so I don't know if Professor Remo can add some further information about this in the guidelines. 
So how do we perform it? How do we do it? We keep the patient in the clinic. It's just quick. It doesn't need any sort of preparations like the colonoscopy. We visualize the sigmoid colon, the descending, transverse, ascending, and the cecum, and the ileocecal valve with the terminal ileum. And after that, we sweep uh, the, bowel, uh, the bowel wall, just trying to identify if there is any sort of inflammation. Normally, the colon has a hostration, as everybody knows, and it's full of air and, uh, and stool, and it's still, it doesn't move, and it has an air artifact, so can, we can only visualize the anterior wall. However, in the small bowel, uh, it's a mobile, it has a fluid, and has a good, so some sort of peristalsis. We have three key sonographic parameters that can be used in identifying a patient with active IBD, mainly if it's intestinal. So we have the bowel wall thickening and the color doppler for the inflammation. We have extra intestinal features such as mesenteric fatty hypertrophy, and also some helpful measures, which is the uh, echostratification pattern and the lymph nodes. We know from the med school that the bowel wall has five layers. We have the mucosa, the muscarous mucosa, submucosa, muscarous propria, and serosa. But for any, any person who's, a, who's doing a bowel ultrasound, and mainly if he's a gastroenterologist, we, we can view three layers only. The mucosa, which is the black shade, the submucosa, and the muscularis. And what I meant by stratification that I mentioned earlier, that we have a layering like black, white, and black. So if it's thin, uh, well stratified, that means that we doesn't have any sort of inflammation, uh, especially if it's like around three millimeters in, in diameter. However, if we have an inflammation, then there will be a good bowel wall thickening and a loss of stratification. Checking for inflammation, we just, within the same probe, we just check for the uh, vascularity. And we have a good, we're relying on the Lindbergh score grade that has been published in 1999, in which, and the score is scaling from uh, uh, one to uh, four. If it's one, that means just only bowel wall thickening without any pixels of inflammation. Two is minimal, three is just within the bowel wall, and if it's like crossing all the way to the mesentery, that means we're dealing with uh, stage four. Extra luminal, also around any inflamed bowel, we go through the, uh, uh, we check the, uh, the mesenteric uh, fat around it. So if we have an inflammation, we can see this uh, white shade around the bowel, and that's indicated that the patient is having an inflammation. And if the, if we, when we keep the patient on treatments and management, then this can be reversible and regressive. One more thing, as I mentioned, some helpful measures. The uh, echo stratification. Echo stratification goes with how bad is the inflammation. So if we lose the stratification, that means we really have a good sort of uh, transmural inflammation. Lymph nodes, I guess the pediatricians are interested in this because we can see it very frequent in kids, not in adults. We can't rely much on the lymph nodes because it's elliptical and uh, black, I would say like a black elliptical or all um, oval in shape, but it's irreversible. So once you have an inflammation, even if you keep the patient in medication, this, the size of the uh, lymph node won't regress. So in our clinical practice, where can we position the bowel ultrasounds in our IBD patients? Actually, according to the ECHO guidelines, we have to monitor the bowel wall and measure the bowel wall uh, inflammations and thickness after six months of starting the medication. But some doctor would say, well, we does not want to wait how, how soon we can do the bowel ultrasounds. According to the TRUST trial that has been uh, published in 2017 by, uh, by the IBIS, one of the IBIS members team, uh, there is a one prospective trial with multi-center, including 47 centers, and uh, with a cohort number of more than 200, and the aim is to identify, will intestinal ultrasound help in knowing uh, uh, if the patient is responding very well to the medications or no. They monitor the patient at week zero, one, uh, at week zero three months, six months, and 12 months. Upon following up the patient, and you can see here from the charts that there was a high significant uh, proportions of patients with normalizations of the bowel wall uh, if they are in the ideal, uh, ideal treatments, and that included all segments, the terminal ileum, the ascending, the transverse, the descending, and the sigmoid colon. All of us are aware about the Stardust trial that has been published using the Stikunumab and managing our patients. And the idea of this trial is just to follow three to target approach for our IBD patients. 
But we have a sub-study that has been published in 2020 in which 77 patients, they were included in the study, and they did a bowel ultrasound for them at week 0, 4, 8, and 16. The result was really nice, and I would have say like very promising. Like after a follow-up of a year, we, they found that the patient has a good intestinal response, and the intestinal response meant a reduction of 25% uh, from the baseline of the bowel wall thickening and a good transmural healing at the end of the follow-up of the year. Even now, we can do bowel ultrasound for a case of ulcerative colitis. Uh, so there's a, a good prospective German trials that has been published in 2020. And they included around 40 centers uh, with a cohort number of more than 200 also. They monitored the patients because they are ulcerative colitis at week 0, 2, 6, and 12 months. I still remember that Professor Christian Mazur was very happy upon the result because after two weeks, he realized a complete normalization of the bowel wall thickening. So when we keep the patients on the proper treatment, the bowel wall thickening will reduce and even the inflammation, and the, uh, and even the inflammation will go down. So the other question is, can the ultrasound finding, if we found the patient like in a complete remission, would this give us a prediction about the long-term outcome? And can we reach our treat-to-target approach according to TRI trial in the long term? So this is a nice Italian trial that has been uh, published in 2020, and they included a patient uh, uh, who were having a Crohn's disease and mainly terminal ileal Crohn's disease. They did ultrasound at week zero. They introduced anti-TNF medication, and they followed the patient for 18 months. After that, they subcategorized the patient into, th into three groups. The people who were in a complete, res a complete responder and partial and non-responder. And they followed the complete responder patients for a year, and they found that they didn't require surgical intervention. There was a small amount of steroid used for these patients and also fewer hospitalizations and admission. And that means they had a really good and better quality of life. At the end, in case of complications, can ultrasound detect the complication? The answer for sure is yes. It can detect bowel abscesses, sinus tract and fistula, and also it can detect strictures and stenosis. So ultrasound has a good sensitivity and a specificity with a pool result of sensitivity 84% and specificity can reach up to 93% in identifying phlegmen and abscesses. And this also has been confirmed in the uh, uh, EFSIM guidelines and the echo Esger guidelines that has been published. Also, ultrasounds can identify the fistula with a good pool result of 47% and specificity of 95%. Strictures, the most common complication that we can see. Ultrasound has a high sensitivity. It doesn't work, the video. Ultrasound has a really good sensitivity and specificity in identifying the stricture. So we can see here that we have a really long stricture and the uh, post, um, post stenotic dilatation. Because we're really short of time, so for any person who's really interested in learning bowel ultrasound, you can view some of our consensus that has been published with the IBUS group, looking for uh, 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 in which they publish a good scoring for the uh, uh, good scoring, how to measure the bowel wall thickening, how to identify the inflammations, and also how to follow the patients and how to confirm if these patients are in symptomatic remission and response. At the end, what did I, what did I learn from uh, in using bowel ultrasound? Ideally, we have to go with the flow follow the treat-to-target approach. So at, at week zero, we have to identify the patient, investigate him thoroughly, including the ultrasound. After four to six weeks, we can just do a quick scan for five to six minutes. And in three months interval, you have to do the ultrasound also and with the biomarkers to confirm the, uh, the remission. Six months, again, we have to repeat the uh, investigations from the scratch, including the bowel ultrasound, and even after a year. So three months interval is reasonable in following up our patients. So at the end, like now, most of the international guidelines and the recommendation are supporting and including the usage of radiological imaging in managing our uh, IBD patients. They included ultrasound as part of the investigational modalities. Ultrasound ultrasound has a really good fundamental role in identifying the patient and following up the patients. And for sure, we need a further study and further publications to standardize the usage of ultrasound. Thank you very much, and I would like to introduce Professor Vito 